Okay, I want to start with the word of Scripture to get us started today. It's going to be Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. So I've titled my talk today that God has a plan. Pretty simple title. Subtitled, My Life from the Wide Road to the Narrow Road. And I'm honored to be given this opportunity and chance to share with you Trinity students. Uh, I'm a dad to one of my sons named Andy who 10 or 12 years ago studied on this campus actually got married right here uh, some time ago and was his best friend and his accountability partner was Dr. Felix. So there's, there's quite a connection uh, with, with that relationship. And as Felix mentioned, my son Todd is uh, the men's basketball coach. Uh, so again, I have a heart for, for Trinity because of those things, but it means a lot because of what they stand for and what Trinity stands for and how they prepare students to serve the Lord effectively and that Christ is exalted. So, again, thank you, Trinity, for having me here. And I pray that in a tiny or large way, the things that I will share today, the little chat that I have with you students, uh, may encourage each of you in some particular way, and only God knows how that could work. Uh, You are blessed with an amazing faculty here on this campus. Um, Incredible teaching, Christian teaching, some of the most amazing Christian teachers, you know, in the country. And I'm going to leave the Christian teaching to those guys, because they're they're awesome at it. And today, (laughs) I'm going to focus my talk on how God has worked in my life and how I got pointed to Jesus and the road that it took and how long, actually, that it took and share my experiences over 64 years. And again, this, this, this framework and this theme is God has a plan. And as we get started, I want to make sure it's very clear that the foundation of His, of his plan is his love for the people of the world. Us people, every single one of us. And we have to realize, and you'll hear this as I unpack this, but we have a huge, huge problem. It's called sin. Every single one of us. And God has one plan to address our biggest problem, our sin problem, and that was sending Jesus to come to be our rescuer. I'm pretty slow uh, to learn, I would would guess, because I was deceived. It took me 37 years of life to finally understand that little foundational point that I just made about sin. And I was on this wide road that I read about in Matthew 7, uh, for a long time. And what does the, lo- the wide road lead to? It leads to destruction. So that's right where I was. I was as happy and as blind as could be, but that's where I found myself. And the sad thing about it was that I called myself a Christian. That's how, what, I say, what I mean when I say I was deceived. I thought I was a Christian, and I went to church, and I did things that Christians do, but I had you know, something hugely missing, and I'll be talking even more and more about that. So here's a snapshot of, it's probably more than a snapshot, because look at, I got about 85 pages that I'm going to be sharing from, but uh, a snapshot of how God God has worked in my life and how blind that I was to Him for so long. And I just want to encourage every one of you that God is in the process of writing a story with your life being the center of it. So you have just as important and a valuable story as the one that I'm about to share. And each of us have the same 
opportunity that God wants. He wants us to be on his team. He wants us to come back to him, have our sins forgiven. And he wants us at some point in our lives to finally open our eyes and realize the life he's given us is to bring glory to him. So again, from the wide road to the narrow road, that is, that's, these are Jesus' words uh, that, I, that I'm uh, speaking of. And God wants us to have that faith in his son Jesus. Much of my life story is intersected by the game of basketball. Um, the, there's several of you here uh, that probably are going to love some of these stories. Like Felix, you know, already stole about half of my speech with some of my Kareem Abdul-Jabbar stories and NBA stories. But um, some of you are going to love some of that stuff. Some of you probably could care less about basketball or sports or whatever. So I'm hoping, though, that the theme of the story isn't about me and it isn't about sports and it isn't about all these crazy things that I'm about to share. But I want to highlight Christ's incredible worth to me and his incredible worth to all of you. So here we go. I uh, grew up in South Bend, Indiana. I had great parents. I was the baby of the family. I had two older brothers. Uh, growing up in South Bend, it's where Notre Dame is. Just loved going to Notre Dame, football games and uh, basketball games, all sports on the campus. As a little kid, I was the normal kid for back in the day. Uh, I used to play four square, capture the flag, basketball, football, every type of sport. I was just what you would call a normal kid, uh, typical kid. Our family attended the Methodist church growing up, went to Sunday school every Sunday, went to church and sat in the pews, and uh, that, was, that was my upbringing uh, from a Christian stand, standpoint. Um, I just didn't have a clue about who Jesus was, and that is why I stayed on the wide road uh, for so long. Um, my dad uh, was an awesome guy. He uh, was working for a company, and this is way before your all's time, and your parents will probably remember a company called Studebaker Corporation, and they built cars, and just like Ford and, you know, all these big car, the Tesla, they're way before Tesla, not quite the same type. But, you know, it was a good car manufacturer. My dad was a big sales guy and traveled the, the world, actually. But at about age 37 or so, he decided that his passion was to teach kids golf, and he loved golf. So he gave up the corporate job, and he followed his dream and his passion and went to be a golf pro at a teaching course in South Bend called Studebaker Golf Course. So all of a sudden, I became a guy who loved golf because my dad was out there. I was probably eight years old. I was out playing golf every day. So, you know, I just watched and observed at what my dad's passion was. And again, loving kids, teaching people, and just had a, had a I would say, a calling to, to go do that. Well, at age 41, after he had been doing that for about four years, I was like 10 years old at the time, he had a heart attack and he died. So prematurely, uh, tragedy came into our lives. Uh, the one thing is I look back at it as a 10-year-old. I look back and I had a front row seat of seeing God's hand being right there and never leaving me and guiding me and he comforted me through this time. And I honestly wasn't thinking about God. So I wasn't like, okay, my dad died, so now I'm like a Christian, and man, boom. But as I look back as to where I'm standing now, God was right there, and he comforted me, and he led and uh, took care of, of our entire family. So the... Wide road, again, even after that tragedy, that's where I stayed. I was still on the wide road. And I didn't know I was on the wide road. I was just on my road. My road was just being a kid, just chilling, doing whatever came along. Um, so 
one thing about being the baby of the family and having two brothers, you have lots of opportunities to be impacted by your brothers. So let me start with the first one, Spike. Spike's the oldest. He's like the trailblazer of our family. He's six years older than me. Uh, here's an a interesting story about Spike. He felt it was up to him to toughen up the baby of the family. So he had a great idea for Christmas. He bought some boxing gloves for me and for him, and he took me down in the basement and said, okay, put those gloves on, TT. He called me TT, and he just pummeled me down there. He just tore me up, and I was crying and screaming. Fortunately, my mom came down and, and rescued me. But, so that's my big brother, Spike. You know, he's, he's, he, he's looking out for me. But he did another thing that was uh, interesting. He, he chose Indiana University to attend. So we're in South Bend, which is the northern part of the state, and IU is pretty far down, probably about four-hour drive back then because they didn't have the big roads. But, so he went to IU. So he was a role model for me and somebody, except for the boxing gloves, that somebody I really admired and wanted to follow after. Uh, my second brother, his name is David. And David was two years older than me. And when David was born, he had a tremendous amount of physical problems. He had so many problems, and he, he had so many deformities in his body that my parents had to make a tough decision, which they did back in the day, of having a child cared for in a, an institution. So David never got to live at our house, and he was uh, in a a place called Muscatatuck State Hospital, which is in um, Mount, uh, North, Vernon? North Vernon, Indiana. So I can remember vividly as a young kid being with my mom and dad and Spike and I in the back seat fighting all the time, but uh, driving all the way down to Muscatatuck to visit David and hang out with David and be, you know, a part of his life. And again, when you're a little kid, you're not analyzing and thinking about, man, this is stinks for David. This is, man, this isn't cool and good or whatever. So again, I was sort of clueless, but I, you know, I just was impacted. I was incredibly impacted by the time I spent with, with him. And I also was impacted that after my dad died, my mom had to make the decision, that didn't have to, she wanted to make the decision to move him up to a facility up in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And so David was closer, Fort Wayne to South Bend's maybe an hour and an hour and a half or so. So he moved up there, and uh, unfortunately, when he was 16 and I was 14, he was, uh, one of his de deformities was in his uh, area where food would get easily uh, in his, you know, windpipe or whatever, and he died. He, he choked on food uh, at this institution, and again, he died. Uh, when, again, I was 14 and, and he was 16. So as I look back and I, now I'm older, I'm a Christian, I understand, you know, God is unbelievable and he's amazing. And what a blessing it was for me to have a brother named David who had a life totally different from my life. And I'm the man I am today because of what I was able, what God allowed me to experience and live through uh, seeing David's life and his death. And thinking about that, and thinking that I'm a parent, as Felix mentioned, we've got nine grandkids and then three of our own kids. I'm just amazed and blown away and grateful that God gave my parents the courage to have a third boy. What would you guys do? What would you think about if you had a, a child like David? I mean, it'd be tempting to say, two's enough. I mean, we're not going to go through this again. It's too heartbreaking. Can you imagine how your heart would feel if one of your kids was, you know, had to be cared for outside your home and stuff? So anyway, I look back. Again, I wasn't analyzing any of this stuff at the time, but I sure look at it now and say, dang, God, thank you for giving them that courage. And had they not taken that step, I wouldn't be here right now. Felix wouldn't have had an accountability partner. And the basketball team, probably Q would be leading them, I would say. But, you know, uh, Todd wouldn't be here coaching. So anyway, 
it's amazing uh, just, just as I, I look at that uh, situation. And, you know, looking at that whole situation, you would think, man, Tom had to run to God. Uh, he, he got saved after his brother died. He was a freshman in high school. I was going to be saved, and just my life was going to impact the entire world. No, I was still on the wide road. I still had nobody who really shared with me how I got off the wide road. I didn't know I was on the wide road. I didn't know I had sin that kept me on the wide road. I didn't know. I was clueless. So anyway, I stayed uh, where I was in my little comfort zone, and um, I never realized that it was Christ is who I really needed. So I still went to church, thought I was a Christian, and again, till 37 years old, I had called myself a Christian. Um, I was blind, I was deceived, but I was incredibly blessed with some amazing worldly success and blessings. And uh, Felix, you know, shared a few of those things. But let me share, you know, how God gave me these, you know, interesting, crazy things that happened in my life. And what's interesting is when you're a non-Christian in the way I was, you tend to hold on to the successes. You know, you get all this stuff happening, and it's great, and it's awesome, and you claim the glory for it. Once you become a Christian, God gets the glory for anything that he allows us to be a part of. But here are the things that I claim glory for for, for a long time. Uh, I was the South Bend City scoring champion. I set the, the all-time leading score in the city of South Bend. Uh, I was on the Indiana All-Star team representing the state of Indiana uh, as one of uh, 12 guys. I got a full scholarship to go to Indiana University. So where Spike had gone and I wanted to go, I never dreamed I'd ever play basketball at a college like that. And I got a chance to go to IU and play. And so when I got to IU, we won four Big Ten championships. So I was there four years. So freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, of four Big Ten championships. I mean, it's amazing what God did in our team and in that I got to be a part of. Uh, we made history in a number of ways, which I'll share here uh, in a second. Uh, one of the ways we were undefeated my junior year, we were uh, in the Big Ten 18-0, and and we won every game until we got to the final eight. We played uh, Kentucky. We were 30-0, and I think. And we played Kentucky, and they beat us 92 to 90. And we were just stunned. I mean, we, we were all ready to go for the national title, et cetera. Boom. It happened. We lost 92-90. We had a whole summer and a whole long period of time, like, saying, we just blew that. So next year, uh, my senior year, uh, we... Um, went undefeated again until the final game. We were 31-0. and uh, We won every Big Ten game, so we're rolling. Everything is, is looking like, finally, we're going to get done what we didn't do the year before. So we're playing uh, in Philadelphia against Michigan for the final game of the NCAA tournament. And two minutes into the game, a guy on the other team, Michigan, who guy played in the NBA, Wayman Britt, steals the ball two minutes into the game, and he goes coast to coast for a layup. And he had no idea that on our team we had a guy by the name of Bobby Wilkerson. And in the final four game, Bobby Wilkerson, who's 6'7", he's a guard, long arms, and he jumped like LeBron. He had 19 rebounds against UCLA in the final four. He chases down Wayman Britt, and Wayman Britt goes up for his layup. And Bobby jumps and misses the block. Wayman Britt's elbow hits Bobby Wilkerson in the head two minutes into the game. And Bobby Wilkerson's laying on the floor of our final game, one of our very best players. We play the rest of that half. They carry Bobby into the locker room and they lay him on a table. He was knocked out and it was just not good. We play the rest of that half. We walk off the court. It's Michigan 35, Indiana 29. So can imagine if you were a fan who 
you know, saw what happened last year, and you're like, don't tell me this is going to happen again. So we walk in the locker room, and the first guy we see is Bobby laying on the table. We walk by him. We get in the locker room, and our coach comes in. And our coach was known as a pretty crazy coach, like Coach Todd probably, just really, you know. Um, he, his name's Bobby Knight. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him. But so anyway, he walks in, and instead of starting throwing chairs at us or doing anything crazy, he said, okay, look at me. Everybody's eye look right at my mouth. You guys are undefeated. You're the best team in this country, and I want you to go out and prove it one more time, one more half. I want this to be the best half that you have, and you walk in the, the locker room and you tell your teammate what just happened. And so guess what happened? We won. <laughs> so we had 57 points. I could have really made it like we blew it again. And <laughs> I stayed on the wide road for the rest of my life. But no. So we, we, uh, so we won the game. We had 57 points, uh, the most points ever scored. Again, you non-basketball players, this stuff is so boring. You're like, who cares about all this stuff? But so anyway, we won the national title. Um, after you win the title, two weeks later, I'm in the president's uh, pre office, the, the Oval Office, and I got to shake the hand of the president. Abraham Link notes. I'm not that old, you guys. <laughs> Do you think I was that old? Um, his, his name was Gerald Ford. So I met that, and then something crazier. Again, this, all this story is what God has done. And, you know, I was thinking I'm the man. You know, I'm meeting the president and all this, winning national titles. Since that day, by the way, no team in NCAA basketball has won, gone undefeated, and won the national title. So we're sort of a famous team. What could have been different, and this, this president of your university has a story that he'll tell some other time, because he was at, at Alabama when they almost beat us in the tournament. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that. But we, we persevered. We got all this fame and glory. And we're still, to this day, the last team to go undefeated. But the crazier thing than that, God still kept doing crazy things in my life. The commissioner of the NBA walks out on the stage and says, with the 43rd pick in the 1976 NBA draft, the Los Angeles Lakers select Tom Abernethy from Indiana University. Then he walks off. The crowd goes crazy. Everyone, no, they, no one knew it. No one knew it. No one knew. I didn't even know I was drafted. It was uh, funny. But, uh, and there was no stage. It was probably a conference call or something. So anyway, so I'm, I'm drafted by the Lakers, and as Felix blew it for me, I sat next to the all-time leading scorer in the NBA for two years. His name's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He was here, and I was here. So there, Felix, you got, you got it for me. Um, and my coach, though, he didn't mention, was Jerry West, who's some of you know basketball. Jerry West is a legend, and he coached me for two years. And then I was able to get because I did pretty well with the Lakers. I got to play with uh, or sign a free agent contract where you get guaranteed money. Like, man, now I'm ready to start rolling. I get money, and they're not, uh, if they get tired of me, I still get paid. So Golden State Warriors is who I, I signed with. And Golden State Warriors were trash back then, <laughs> because, <laughs> probably because of me. But... Um, Anyway, we're not, they weren't the, the ones that you're seeing today. But it, it was fun. It was great. It was amazing. I have one story that Todd wanted me to share with my Golden State Warriors days. But before I do that, when I was with the Lakers, probably the coolest thing that happened in that period of time was my wife, Susie, and I got married. We've been married 41 years. Would you stand up, Susie? Let's clap for Susie. Come on. No, stand up. <laughs> so, two little highlights. We have till what, three today? You guys don't have class or anything today. 
No, so one little thing is we had twins uh, when I was out uh, playing for the Golden State Warriors. And uh, so anyway, that was amazing, Andy and his brother Matt. But the other thing was I had my worst injury in the NBA when I played with Golden State. So we had a game against the Houston Rockets, and they had a guy on their team by the name of Moses Malone. And Moses Malone was like a mountain of a man. He was six foot 11. He weighed 285 pounds, and he had tree trunks for arms. And he was just unbelievable. And so I made a huge mistake in that game. My job for Golden State was to rebound, play defense, make a shot or two. There's a ball on the backboard that I'm ready to grab doing my job, and I had no idea, but right next to me, Moses Malone. And Moses Malone wanted that ball. And so as I went to grab it, boom! A tree trunk of an arm crashed into my two front teeth and knocked my two front teeth backwards. So all I could feel with my tongue were my two front teeth. And so I walk up. I didn't know what to do, so I walk over the hill. <laughs> and I go to my trainer, and he starts looking at my teeth, and he starts pushing it up a little bit, a little bit. And then he said, I'm going to have to go back to California to get my teeth looked at. So I said, okay. So I, I went back to uh, to. California, near where Felix was probably a little baby at that time. Didn't you grow up near Golden State? I mean, didn't you live? Um, okay, anyway. <laughs> I'm trying to get you in the story here, Felix, on every, every other thing. So anyway, so the doctor takes these x-rays, and he walks out, and he's doing this. I said, what are you, what, what are you doing? He said, those teeth are going to have to come out. He said, my teeth are having to come out. You're kidding me, because they got snapped so high. So I played the rest of that season with no teeth, and uh, my wife loved it, right, Susie? She just thought I was the coolest dude ever. But they gave me some fake ones to wear after practice and after games, and then I, I got this put in, and it's been good ever since, right? So, so that was the Golden State era. Um, then I signed with the Pacers, played there. Um, then we ended up going over to Italy to play basketball. I ended up being, like in the NBA, when you're a guy like me, I had to guard these huge dudes, and I was a power forward, and I was a smart player, passer. I could do a little bit of everything. But I was a role player. Even at IU, I was a role player. I get to Italy when I, I played there, and I averaged like, I was the third leading scorer. I averaged like 22, 23 points a game. I was like, man, I like this. I was, you know, sort of the, more of the star. But uh, I had an eye problem, and all of a sudden, I'm riding high, and, you know, I get this eye issue, and so we had to fly back from, from Italy, and that ended my career. And then as a non-Christian at the time, all this stuff, you know, I had no clue what I was a real Christian was, all of a sudden, we fly back, and I have to choose a, a job. And when you're a non-Christian, and this is me, I'm just speaking from experience because I've been there and I understand my thought process. I said, I'm going to find a job where I can make some flow. I want the most money I can get. I'm going to just maximize my uh, amazing talents and make as much money as I possibly can. That's how stupid I was and blind I was. And so I actually, God honored that to the point that I made more money in commercial real estate, which is the profession I chose. Um, and it was like, man, this is amazing. I, I, everything was happening. It's, it's like, man, I'm pretty good, aren't I? And again, I look back and I see how God allowed and blessed and did so many things. Even when I was clueless to who he was, and I was clueless to who his son Jesus was uh, and what he could do and be a part of my life. So I 
stayed in that uh, for a while, and all of a sudden, my wife gets invited to Bible study fellowship. And this thing's a, a big ladies' Bible study thing, and so Susie goes with a neighbor, and she's studying God's Word, and she reads in the Bible that she needs Jesus, and she accepts Jesus. And she's studying, doing her Bible study all night. I'm sitting right here in bed watching ESPN. I'm watching basketball or I'm watching sports. I'm just living my wide road life and thinking everything's just peachy. And she's here just changing. And God got a hold of Susie. And she started praying. She's praying for her husband. I want my husband to know the Lord. I want him to be a Christian. And guess what? Before I knew it, I had a panic attack. It was boom. Thank you, Susie. Her prayers were answered. And I had no idea what a panic attack was, but I had one. And it was like, man, what in the world was that? The first thought that flooded into my mind was, I need to understand the Bible. So panic attack, I need to understand the Bible. It's like God's way of finally getting my attention and speaking to me, and that's what's in my heart and in my mind. And from that point on, I was just starving and hungry, and I couldn't get enough of learning who God really was. And finally, I understood that I was a sinner, and I needed a Savior, and I couldn't save myself. I couldn't, you know, I thought I had built this amazing life because how awesome I was. And everything I touched seemed to turn to gold and all this stuff. But I finally realized that I was a sinner. And I only had one hope, and it was in Jesus, putting my faith and trust in him, that he died on the cross. So I accepted Christ, and finally I left the wide road to the narrow road. And so that was an amazing turning point, uh, obviously, and my kids got impacted by it. So my wife started it. I sort of got on board. And then our kids are looking at us, like listening to all the, instead of all the secular music and all doing all the normal stuff, it's a Christian household all of a sudden listening to Christ honoring music and speakers and, and things uh, like that. And so they got impacted through just, so God had a plan. Right? That's sort of, isn't that the theme of this talk? God had a plan, and it's just been cool to see how we were a part of it, my wife and I, and then Todd and Andy and Matt, and now we have nine grandkids. We're hoping they, you know, are part of that plan. And I'm here today because I hope you guys, every single one of you, are part of this plan, and you understand that God does have a plan. And if you're finding yourself on this wide road, and you can relate to this old dude uh, up here in my story, that you'd realize, man, I'm not going to wait till I'm 37 and blow all those years. I'm going to get on this narrow road. I want to put my faith in Jesus. I want to understand what that, what's all going on around here. And that's my encouragement. And again, it could be one of you. It could be half of you. And I know there's still half of you who said, I care less about basketball and all those stupid stories. But anyway, thanks for, you know, like hanging in there with me. But, you know, that's, that's what, what, what we're here for. And I, I just couldn't encourage you more strongly. Now, I, I went off script on all that, which is the way I normally am anyway. But I needed to make sure that I was trying to paint a picture of a before and an after in, in things that you need to know. Once you accept Christ, guess what? Things aren't just going to be smooth and rolling and not a problem. You're going to still have struggles. You're going to have big time struggles. But guess what? You're never going to go through them alone. You're going to have God right there. You're going to have Christ with you. You're going to have the Holy Spirit inside you that's going to give you wisdom and help you work through situations and just make great, better decisions than you made without the Holy Spirit's help. Um, you're going to learn how to follow God's principles because you're going to be in the Word all of a sudden. You, 
this means something now all of a sudden, and you're going to learn that, man, he's got a way about how I should pick a spouse, you know, how I should pick a job, not like that, like I did. Pick a job how God's wired you, how he's gifted you, how he's made you so that you can do something that brings glory to God. You may make two cents. You may not have the big money and the fancy stuff, but God wants you to be in part of his plan and being used by him, and that's so far greater than the life that I was living when it was about me and about things. Um, You're going to have his peace. You're going to have his joy and you're going to be able to live that life with purpose, and you're going to be able to give glory to God. So I'll close in just reminding you that God does have a plan, and my strong encouragement and prayer is that every single one of you would be joining him in that. Thank you for listening. All right, um, I'm a blessed man. I'm Todd Abernathy, so that is my, my dad. His nickname is Big Tom in our household. So thank you, Pops, for sharing with us. I'm going to deliver the benediction so you can stay seated. But uh, please receive this benediction. May the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loves you and by his grace gives you eternal encouragement and hope, comfort and strengthen your heart, in every good deed and word. May the Lord of peace give you peace continually and in every circumstance. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.